James, or I hope, hopefully you're picking up a, a, a copy of the notes that come in. They're always there in the lobby. You can look for those. Uh, but I have a life-giving, I believe, message today and encouragement to anyone who's facing a test or a temptation in their life. And uh, today we're going to learn some wisdom about what to do during temptation, okay? So as we continue our study in the book of James, we move from tackling the issue of trials to understanding temptations. Now, how many of you remember that trials are meant to mature us in the Lord, right? Absolutely. Temptations are meant to take us away from the Lord. And uh, one temptation that every culture has uh, around the world is, is this, that people who have money and power get the idea that they're somehow special. I just want you to tell your neighbor today, there isn't, ain't nobody special. Just tell them, ain't nobody special, all right? All right. How many of you know we're all sinners? We all uh, need Jesus. We all need grace in our lives. And I want to begin by telling you a little story. When I, when I read this story, it's a story about uh, a flight attendant. And I don't have no, I, I don't have any idea whether this story is true or not. It's probably not true. Somebody invented it, okay? But I, I got to thinking about Courtney Coleman. Many of you know her. She is a flight attendant. And I thought this, this, this story kind of reminded me of her because, you know, Courtney has a lot of uh, life in her and zest and feistiness about her. And so, let, let, so, so I, I love this story. I have no idea whether it's true. Muhammad Ali was on an airplane getting ready for takeoff. And the flight attendant asked him to put his seatbelt on. And this is what his reply was. Superman don't need a seatbelt. So she moved on thinking that he'd go ahead and put the seatbelt on in a, in a moment or two. But she returned and he still didn't have his seatbelt on. And so uh, she says to him, uh, sir, you need to put your seatbelt on. And, and he replies, Superman don't need a seatbelt. Well, uh, this feisty flight attendant said to him, and Superman doesn't need an airplane either, so put your seatbelt on. And, and so sometimes we get to thinking that we're special, right? And James tells us in this passage that, there, that there's a temptation that the wealthy have. They begin to think they're special. They begin to think they're exalted, that they're above others. And so we're going to start with James' thoughts towards those who are wealthy. We're in James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 today. So open your Bible, follow along with us today. It says this, it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Now I tell you, I believe that this is a very powerful commentary on our times because it really levels the playing field of culture, doesn't it? And in cultures around the world, not just in the United States, but everywhere, those who are wealthy get to thinking they're special. They, they get to thinking they're exalted. The rules don't apply to them. Their money can buy power. But what James does in this passage is fascinating because he turns the whole thing upside down. He says it's really the poor man who's exalted. The poor man is exalted because he has to trust in God, right? Hopefully a poor man in his struggles in life will learn that God is real, that God is available. And my contention is that a poor man with Jesus is a lot better off than a wealthy man without Jesus. Come on. I, I, I believe that. And by the way, I have had the privilege of ministering among some of the poorest people on the planet. And yet I, my testimony is that among those people, I have seen great faith, great hope, and great love in their lives. And so James puts the poor and the underprivileged in the exalted position. Why? Because they need God. And James also says that the rich man is going to be humiliated. 
Why? Be, be, why, why? Because the rich man is going to one day fade away. His wealth will be gone. And he doesn't realize or recognize that in his pride. But notice what it says. It says, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. That means his life will one day end and so will his riches. Now, that could mean that maybe even in his life and sometimes riches pass away in someone's life. But it definitely says he will pass away. And James compares his life to a flower, right? He says, you know, it looks nice, it's pretty, but when the sun rises and the burning heat withers the grass, the flower falls off and guess what? It's gone. That place of self-exaltation doesn't mean much in God's eyes. And in our culture, there's a lot of injustices. We've seen that at the forefront this week. It's true. And any honest person has to see that the wealthy live lives of privilege and the poor struggle. And this, this is not just an American thing, is it? I've seen it in many other places in India. In Colombia, where we were missionaries, it's it's horrendous there. But this is what James is saying. He's saying, listen, there's not anybody who's special. And here's why. Because even the wealthy person will die. And at that moment, their wealth is gone. They fade away like the flower of the field. And so the... so. So wisdom is that they recognize the peril of thinking they're exalted when they're really humiliated. And so you say, well, Pastor, why would James bring on such a discussion as this? Uh, why, why, why? Let's read the next verse. Because James goes on to really to say that life is not about your station in life. Life is not about how much money you have, right? Absolutely not. Life, real life, is about loving God. Real life is about enduring and overcoming the temptations of life so that we receive the crown of life. It's true for everybody. Let's read James 1 and verse 12. It says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. I wonder, is there anybody here today who loves God? Come on, raise your hand today. Amen. The goal of every believer is to love God. If you want happiness, you need to endure temptation and receive the crown of life. And in the kingdom, you've got to realize that it's not about money or position. It's about overcoming. It's about believing that the faith that you have in your Jesus, come on, can help you to battle against sin and temptation because at no matter who you are you're going to have temptation come on and if we back up to see the picture of the whole picture of this chapter what james is really doing he's trying to help every believer a lot of believers uh you know struggle with with uh, the tests and trials of life last week we looked at how that 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 that, that james gives advice and, and, and perspective of how to get through those trials and so now he's transitioning to another subject and he's talking about the temptations of life. And, and I don't know about you, but I need some help at times with the, trend, the temptations of life. Is anybody a witness here today? Amen. I need the word, amen, that will encourage me. And so here James gives us today five what I want to call golden nuggets of wisdom about temptation, all right? So you can jot them down today. We're going to just go through them today and almost verse by verse today. The golden nugget of wisdom number one is this, that the promise of eternal life is a powerful motivator to endure temptation. Come on. James says this, blessed is the man who endures temptation for, in other words, because when he has been approved, guess what will happen? He will receive the crown of life. Is anybody looking forward to that moment when you receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him? Now, this is what I've learned in my life. I have learned that rules and regulations and knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong, that does not necessarily keep me away from temptation and yielding to temptation. 
But what keeps me uh, close to Jesus, living the life I ought to live, amen, is loving God. Having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking forward to the promises that my Savior has given, given me, keeps me from sin. And I know this, that when I love God and when God loves me, I feel that and there's a motivation to live the way God wants me to live. Come on. And God has promised us something in this verse that's absolutely amazing. He's promised us eternal life. Something incredible. Receiving the crown of life. Is there anybody who's looking forward to living forever with God in heaven today? Come on. A temptation, what it does, it promises pleasure in the right now. But God says, I'm going to promise you pleasure in the afterlife. Come on. I'm going to give you a, a future that will go on forever. And so if I'm going to endure temptation, I have to have my mind set on my relationship with God and knowing and loving Him. Are you still with me today? Wave at me. Amen. Let me give you a second nugget today. All right. It's found in this phrase. Don't blame God. Don't blame God. Enough already with the blame game. How many of you realize that the blame game is huge in America right now? Come on. Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you just watch one news channel, flip through the news, next two channel, everybody's blaming everybody for everything and blaming it. Come on. Uh, enough already with the blame game. Amen. And James is a man who knows God and he's a defender of God. All right. And many people misunderstand the origin of sin and temptation. And God is not the one who's tempting us. But yet many people use blame to try to justify their tendency to do what is wrong. I think back, it's, it's the blame game's been going on since the Garden of Eden. Come on. God spoke to Eve after she had partaken of the fruit. And she says, he says, Eve, why did you eat of the fruit? And she said, well, she said, you know, the serpent gave it to me. And besides that, it looked good to eat. And I think the serpent said, I would become like you. I would become white. She didn't take responsibility for it. She blamed the, the serpent. Come on. And then God asked Adam, he said, why did you eat the fruit? And Adam was even more bold. He says, you know, it was the woman that you gave to me. That woman gave me that fruit. He really was blaming God, was he not? He was blaming Eve. He was blaming, he was blaming God. He was saying, I wouldn't even be in this place if, if you wouldn't have given me this woman. And that's one of the easiest justifications we can use. When we fall into temptation, am I right? We want to blame others. We don't think it's our fault. We want something outside of ourselves to blame it on. And the ultimate misplacing of blame is when we try to put the blame on God. And that's what James is addressing here in James 1 and verse 13. This is what he says. He said, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. He says two things about God. He says, first of all, God cannot be tempted with evil. Come on. That means that God is completely good without qualification. He's unreservedly good. Without any mixture of evil at all, he is perfectly holy. And the second thing James clearly states is that God himself tempts no one. His holiness is of such a quality, amen, that he doesn't want what's bad for us. Now, how many of you know that God does test us? Amen. We see that in the Word. You can see how, you can see how uh, some examples of God's testing Abraham, right? By having him offer his son Isaac. You can see that Israel was tested because they were surrounded by all of these ungodly nations. But, but yet, I'm going to tell you something. God will never uh, tempt his people to, to try to destroy their faith. I can assure you that God will never put a temptation out in front of you. And then when you fall for that temptation, say, ah, ha, ha, you didn't make it. No, sir. He may put tests and trials in our path, and that's for our good. So then we have to ask this, this question, then where does sin and temptation come from? How many think that's a good question? 
James tells us straight up, James 1 and 14, he said, but each one, everybody say each one, amen, how many of you know we're all each one, hello, each one, you and me, we are tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. What's the origin of temptation? What's the origin of sin? Where does the blame lie? It lies within ourselves. That one of the greatest hindrances to fighting temptation is not realizing where the origin of that attraction to sin lies. It lies within us. Well, a lot of people, they just want to either blame God or blame the devil, right? How many of you ever heard that old saying, the devil made me do it? Come on. Are you sure about that? Now, I'll be the very first one to tell you that we got to be aware that there is spiritual warfare. Come on. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And we've got to realize that spiritual warfare is a real thing, right? And Satan is really a tempter. But now I want you to catch this today. Listen, Satan cannot tempt you if already down on the inside of your soul, down on the inside of your heart, you already have an attraction towards that thing. Come on. And so we can't really blame the devil. It's our internal struggle that causes us to be tempted, drug away, and enticed. Come on. And we sometimes fall into the trap of giving the devil too much credit. Come on. Amen. He just doesn't have that much credit. Come on. Uh, You know, uh, every time something negative or bad happens, uh, you know, we say, you know, oh, man, it's the devil. Are you sure it's the devil? Come on. You know, we don't uh, we shouldn't automatically assume that even when we're being tempted, we shouldn't say the enemy's trying to get me and trip me up right now. Uh, We really shouldn't assume that because what's interesting as you study this passage here, you don't find that James mentions the devil even one time. Not even one time. In fact, what he does, he mentions the sovereignty of Almighty God over tests and trials. And so if we're going to take this thing seriously, and I'm taking it seriously, and I know you will too, we need to understand that each person is tempted and when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. You say, well, why is that important? Why is it important that we know that? Because you can't prepare yourself for temptation if you're addressing the wrong thing. Are you with me? If you've got heart trouble, are you with me? Taking medication for your kidneys isn't going to help. I mean, and we can't go to battle if we don't really understand what the what it, what it really is. It's not God. It's not the devil. The problem lies with inside of us. What's going on on the inside? And so, if we're going to overcome, one of the first steps we've got to do is recognize that our own desires entice us, and be honest about that. Our own desires lead us astray, and stop blaming God. Stop blaming the devil. Stop blaming your boss. Stop blaming your uncle. Stop blaming your family lineage. Come on and start taking responsibility for our own selves. Come on. Give the Lord a big hand of praise if you believe it today. All right. Let me give you that third nugget. All right. This is a powerful one right here. This is the heart of the message. All right. Here it is. Your desires can be dangerous. Your desires can be dangerous. Hello? In other words, don't give in to your desires or you may give birth to something that you don't want. Am I right? Now, in the human realm, this has happened many, many times. Am I right? Come on. People give in to desires. We're all adults here. We know what we're talking about. People give in to desire. We're not all adults here. I guess I can't say that this morning. People give in to desires. And guess what happens? Somebody gets pregnant. And guess what? A baby's coming. Am I right? (laughs) We give in to desires and a baby's coming. Now, that's okay if you're married and you want a baby. But if you were just fooling around, guess what? I'm telling you, a baby's coming anyhow. Hello? And as we look at this passage in James, it's interesting that James compares temptation to conception, pregnancy, and 
giving birth. Let's read it today. James 1 and verse 14 and through 16. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has, notice what it says, conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved Brother. Now, James uses the language of giving birth two times in this passage. He says, when desire has what? Conceived, it gives birth to sin. And he says, when sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. That's a picture of pregnancy and giving birth as well. Am I right? It brings forth death. It's an allusion to birthing, okay? And so stop and meditate on this and it becomes really easy to understand because in the same way that once the prog- process of pregnancy start, there's nothing really anybody can do to stop it. I mean, other than have an abortion. Come on. But, but, but what it means is a baby's coming, right? You can't stop nature once it's got started, right? How many of you tracking with me? Very difficult to stop. What has happened once there's a conception? Oh, I'm preaching good today. Let me put it in medical terms to you. The act of procreation leads to conception. Conception to gestation and gestation to birth, all right? If you understand your lessons in biology, then you understand this. Because once the process begins, nature takes over. There's an inevitability about it. And the end is implicit in the beginning, right? Does that make sense? James is kind of waking us up to the danger in letting us know that if our desire direct us that we're going to bring forth something we're going to be we're going to conceive something that's going to bring forth sin and sin is going to touch us and bring forth death come on and the greatest warning that we can take from this is this are you tracking with me today that there is no such thing as a small compromise a little pet sin that won't affect anyone else you ever heard anybody say something like this? Well, I'm not cheating. I'm just flirting a little. I'm just flirting a little. Or even, I'm just thinking about it. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's just in my mind. I'm just thinking about it. How many of you know that when we're not directing our desires, our desires are directing us? Come on, somebody. And you may think right now, well, there's a whole massive difference between flirting and actually having an affair or cheating or doing whatever. But let me tell you something. What happens is you you start doing something. You might conceive something. And guess what? The process takes over. And before you know it, you're doing something you never intended to do in the first place. I'm here today to tell you that our desires can be dangerous. Come on, somebody. It's like with parenting, right? When you give your child, when you give in to your child, just for the smallest minute, right? You know, it can bring forth some consequences. Like, let's say in the morning when you're just getting up, you haven't had any coffee yet. Have we got any coffee drinkers here today? Oh, God loves the coffee drinkers and the teetotalers too. Come on. They ask you for candy and you say, not right now. And so they ask again and it sounds like this. Ah, so candy. And they start screaming for candy. Now, I know this is other people's kids that don't go to this church. Come on, I'm preaching about them. You know what I'm saying? All right, but they start crying like that. And so you say you're tired and you so, they keep on and they keep on. And so just to get them quiet, you go ahead and you give them some candy. Am I right? You think it's just once it's not going to matter. I know they're not asking properly. I know. How many of you think those kids are going to stop? How many of you think we just taught them something? That if they scream long enough, if they scream loud enough, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get some candy, right? (laughs) And how many of you realize that it's probably not a month later that they come and ask for candy? How many of you know it's probably going to be just a few minutes after that candy's gone? They're going to come back and ask for some more candy. Hello, hello. I'm just going to tell you that careful where your desires lead us. And this passage teaches us that we need to think ahead about consequences. Let me give you a real life example because everybody's been thinking about that this week. When your desires conceive, they give birth to sin. And when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. 
My, and my, the question in my mind these last two weeks is this. What evil desire was in the heart of a Minneapolis police officer when he decided to keep his knee on George Floyd's neck for so many minutes? What evil desire was there? Because it says that your desires conceive something and then that brings forth sin and sin brings forth death. This is a perfect example of that, right? Was it the desire that he had to show off his powerful dominance over a huge six foot six African American man? Was it his desire to show hatred to a race that wasn't his own? Was it a desire to get revenge for something in the past? Was it his desire but whatever it was that desire conceived and gave birth to sin Sin of murder and full-grown sin has brought forth death. Death to his life as a police officer. Death to his marriage, from what I understand. And death to any respect that he would have anywhere on the planet. And, and spiritual death if he doesn't repent. Come on. You say, well, I wonder how that happened. I'm going to tell you what happened. It started really, I think, a long time ago. A long time ago. When he let his anger take over. And his prejudice take over. And his bullying take over. And on and on and on. And you know, I wonder today from where he's at. I wonder if he's thinking about this. What did I conceive? How did this, how did I, how did I get here? How did I get here? Let me tell you, our desires can be dangerous. Come on, tell me if I'm preaching the truth this morning. Come on. Enduring temptation means staying faithful. It means loving God so much that you have this distaste towards sin and compromise. Come on. Amen. But most of all, to be able to endure temptation, we've got to be willing to look inward and say, listen, what thing on the inside of me needs to be changed. And as we take that to the Lord in prayer, I believe that we serve a God that can put a different desire and a different hope down on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. I believe that today. Let me give you another golden nugget of wisdom. Number four, don't be deceived. James 1 and 16 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. A lot of deception in our world today. In regards to temptation and sin. People deceive themselves into thinking that giving into temptation has no consequences. They, they, they say something like this. If it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. If I'm sneaky enough to go ahead and get away with it, then I'm alright. Nothing's going to happen to me, really. Are you sure? Or are you deceived in your mind and in your thinking? Let's just jump out of the book of James for a minute. Over to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. This is what the Word says. How many don't want to know what the Word says today? It says this, but exhort one another daily. By the way, that's what I'm doing today. I'm preaching and exhorting. That means encouraging, preaching forth the Word. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest, notice what it says, any of you be hardened. Everybody say hardened. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How many know there's a deceitfulness to sin? Sin's a liar. It'll deceive. And, 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 and it does harm to you. And one of those things, among many, is that it hardens you. Am I right? It's, and, and there's a lot of anger in our society right now. And, I, and rightly so. I, I can understand that anger. The great bulk of the thousands upon thousands of protesters are angry and they express it on our streets and in marches and by holding signs and they express it by taking a knee or, or by laying on the ground for, uh, for nine minutes. And that's okay, right? I think that's, how many think that's okay? How many of you stand in favor of being able to protest? Come on, wave at me today. This is the discussion we're having, all right? But there's another group, a much smaller group, that's participating in this concept of rioting and looting and burning and destroying things. And what I want to say is that they are deceived. They're deceived. They're deceived. Because they're thinking to themselves, I'm getting away with something. I can assure you that somewhere in America today, there's somebody, I have no idea who it is, somebody who's watching their new TV set 
that they stole out by looting and rioting. And they're thinking, I'm okay, I'm good. I look at this new TV set I got. They don't realize that something has happened to them on the inside. Hello, they're deceived. They think they got away some, with something. But, but, but how many of you know there's something that happens when you break one of the Lord's commandments? There's a deceitfulness to sin. And part of that deceit is that you get hard on the inside. And when you keep doing it, you get harder and harder and harder. And there's a lot of people that say, well, that police officer killed George Floyd. Yes, he did. And I'm upset about it. And I'm praying for justice in that situation. It wasn't right. Come on. But that doesn't make looting and rioting right either. Here's what I believe today. That the people who peacefully protest are processing this in a way that's going to cause them to grow. I believe that. And I've actually seen it on the TV. I've seen people weeping and crying as they walk down the streets together. I've seen police officers crying as they hugged some of the protesters. And I believe, especially for believers, something's going to happen in their hearts. And this is what my prayer is during this whole scenario as I've been watching this thing. I was telling the Lord, Lord, I don't want to be deceived by any sin on the inside of me. What I want is for my life and my heart to get softer and my love to grow and get bigger. Come on. And I believe that for believers especially, amen, as they observe all of this, as they protest as their right is to in the United States of America, they're not going to get harder. They're going to get more loving and they're going to get softer. Come on. If you believe that, would you give the Lord a hand of praise today? So don't get deceived. Sin does have consequences. And then number five, are you still with me today? Remember that God is good. Tell your neighbor God is good. God is good. The more I study the book of James, the more I appreciate him because he's a defender of God. He defends God. And this is kind of a summary statement here. James 1.17, he says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, he says, listen, God is the giver of good gifts. He's defending God. He says God is good. Even in your tests and your trials earlier in this chapter, he said God is good because he's going to take that and he's going to work something in you so that you become stronger and more healthy spiritually and more mature and more complete. He says God is good because he won't tempt you with evil. He, God doesn't want you to stumble. He wants you to win a victory over sin. Come on. And how many of you know that God has so many good gifts? Come on. He's given us the beautiful, wonderful Word of God. Is there anybody here today that loves the Word of God? Come on. He's given us that Word, amen, to strengthen our resolve and guide our footsteps. God has given us the mighty, powerful Holy Spirit. Come on. The paraclete, the one who's called alongside to help us at every moment. He's right there to give us His guidance and His direction. Come on. And God has given us the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. A community where you can come in and you can say, this is who I really am. This is where I really struggle. And you can find hope and you can find help and you can find love. Come on. How many of you know that God is love? All good gifts come from our Father in heaven. And I believe there's a lot of good gifts to be thankful for. Is there anybody who's thankful today for the gift of sunshine? Come on. Is there anybody who's thankful today for marriage? Hallelujah. Is there anybody that's thankful today for the gift of family, for the gift of moms, for the gift of dads? Come on. Is there anybody who's thankful even for the gift of justice that God has put in our world today? Come on. Amen. I'm thankful for a lot of things. Amen. He's given so much. The beauty of nature, the joy of family, the wonder of friends and community. And God has given us the gift of his faithfulness in that he is unchanging and always the same. 
Amen. Tell your neighbor God does not change. Amen. How many know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? There are no shadows when it comes to God. There's no shadow of turning. All right. No variation in him. He is good from day one until the day he calls you home to glory. And throughout the end of the ages, throughout all the ages that are to come, I'm just here today to tell you that God is good. Come on. Give him praise if you believe that God is good in this house. He's so good that when it comes to temptation, he'll always give you a way of escape every time. Amen. Amen. He's so good when it comes to temptation, if you'll just watch and pray. Keep your eyes open for that way of escape and lift your voice to the Lord in prayer. He'll hear you. He'll strengthen you. And he'll let you be an overcoming. Come on. I'm just here today to tell you that God is with us. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful to the Lord today. And I'm convinced today that most believers today, most Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to make it to heaven. They're convinced of that. Amen. Amen. But I wonder, are we convinced enough to know that if we live a life that's toward God, following God, hard after God, that our God's going to give us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. He'll give us all that we need. Amen. Amen. That is his word today. And as we come to the last verse in this section, he really brings forth a, another birth. <laughs> the new birth. Amen. James 1 and verse 18. He talks about one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given. He said, of his own will, he brought, brought us forth. He gave birth to us by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. In other words, I just love the way James writes. While, writes, while, while desire gives birth to sin and sin brings forth death, God, out of his own will, out of his own desire, guess what he did? He brought us forth by the word of truth, allowing us to be born again. That we might become the first fruits of his creation. That's a huge phrase. Sounds a little bit difficult to understand. But it's really not that difficult. Everybody knows. Who knows what a first fruit is? It's the first cherry off the tree. It's the first corn off the cob, off the stalk. It's the first fruit. right? Jesus was the first fruit. How was he the first fruit? Because he died, was buried. Guess what happened? On the third day, he rose again. Come on. Jesus has proven that he has power over life and death. He says, I hold the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I am he who was dead, but am now alive forevermore. He's the first fruit. Are you with me today? And let me tell you something. What he says is not only Jesus is the first fruit, but when we're born again by the will of God. Come on. When we get born again, let me tell you something. We become a different type of creation because let me tell you, that cow out there in the field is going to die and be gone. But let me tell you something. Believers are going to live forever in heaven with him. Come on, can we give him a shout of praise today? I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful for all that he's ever done in my life today. Amen. Would you stand with me today? Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back. Amen. Amen. I know I've been preaching a while. Man, I get, I get some people in here to preach to. Amen. That's so nice. I've been preaching to purple chairs. It's hard to, the teacher, does, the preacher does better, better when you were there. It's hard to preach to an empty chair. Hello. Hey, that's an old poem I've known a long time, but it really was true. I'm just glad we're back together. Amen. Aren't you glad? You've got everything that you need. God is good. God is good. He's good. He's good. If you're watching today online and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you for just a moment. You can become part of this giant first fruit of creation. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter who you, what you've done in your life. What matters the most importantly is that you come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to pray with you today. If you need Jesus, you can just repeat these words. Just say, dear Heavenly Father, dear Heavenly Father, 
I need you. I know I'm a sinner. I failed. I haven't been right. But today, with faith,